Um, I am delighted, folks, to be here today to introduce Steve Umbrello, who I've worked with for the last seven to eight years. Um, Steve is a, a remarkably productive, uh, for, for someone at my stage of life, um, a, a daily annoyance in terms of how productive he is, but uh, uh, a remarkably productive and wide-ranging scholar. He currently serves as the managing director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. He holds a PhD from the University of Turin where he teaches. He studied philosophy of science and technology at the University of Toronto and ethics at the University of Edinburgh and uh, is author of the book, Designed for Death, Controlling Killer Robots, which we'll be talking about today. But I just wanna read the titles of some of his recent, just 2002 paper, 2022 papers democratization of quantum technologies, values for a post-pandemic future, designing genetic engineering technologies for human values, human enhancement and reproductive ethics on generation ships, which I love. We've done a lot with popular culture over the years um, at the IET, and so Steve is also continuing that tradition. And um, we also wanted to announce before we get into Steve's talk that, um, and this talk relates to that, so some of you may be interested in this. Uh, we have a call for papers out for the Journal of Ethics and Emerging Technologies, which IET publishes for uh, papers about emerging technologies and their impacts on conflict, war, military. Um, and the deadline for that call for papers is the end of December. So if you're interested, please look at the uh, jeet.iet, that's jeet.iet.org uh, webpage and the CFP is there for that set of papers. So with that out of the way, um, Steve, I'm gonna ask you to share your PowerPoint. Okay, tell me when you see it. Yep, see it. Okay, if I switch, you'll be able to see that, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. So I hope I don't bore too many people uh, in the chat because the book, although I, uh, the book is essentially based on my doctoral dissertation, so it is more technical in nature, although I tried to design the book itself the way it reads to be a little bit more um, approachable by the interested reader. So someone who's approaching the text with maybe a modest background on some of the ethical, legal issues surrounding autonomous weapon systems, but I approached it from the approach of design since I, I work at Delft University of Technology, we have, uh, we appropriate the, the literature on responsible innovation and value sensitive design. And I tried to amalgamate uh, the concepts of meaningful human control, something that's burgeoning right now at TU Delft by scholars like Filippo Santoni de Sio and Jeroen and Vandenhoven, and some of the value sensitive design uh, literature and work that I've been focused on um, within the last decade. So um, let me see if I can switch this here. Okay. So the concept of meaningful human control originates within the discourse on autop autonomous weapon systems. And what it is, is, it emphasizes the notion that humans have to remain in a position of control or oversight over the decision-making of a, a, lethal, a lethal system. So in other words, these types of systems shouldn't be able to execute lethal action without some sort of human intervention. And the quote you see here is by a scholar and political theorist uh, and military strategist, Thomas K. Adams. Uh, and he communicates the difficulty of formulating a practical solution while also preserving the ever increasing processing rates that accompany increased automation. There's obviously a great benefit to increased automation, the ability to uh, process large quantities of data. And, um, Let's see. Okay, so I don't like the way my mouse works. So I hope I don't skip over too many slides. Um, so although technological innovations have always played a key role in, in military operations, autonomous weapon systems, uh, I think most of us who are here today noticed that received an asymmetric attention within the public debate, as well as the academic discussions. And this is for good reason. So as these systems are designed to carry out more and more tasks that were obviously more within the domain of human operators, the questions regarding their autonomy and potential recalcitrance, so emergent unwanted behavior, 
have obviously been the cause of the spark discussion. So the debate highlights a potential accountability gap between their use and who, if anyone, can even be held accountable. So at the international level, discussions about how to exercise control over the development and deployment of these autonomous military systems have been underway for over a decade easily. But, and as last year we've seen at the CCW, there still remains very little consensus as to what constitutes a sufficient level of control. So the concept of meaningful human control has emerged in this discourse to encompass what I would say is the ideal of human control over autonomous systems. And there's been various approaches that have taken to define what would be a sufficiently robust notion of meaningful human control that addresses the technical requirements, proper training for design or user engagement, things like operations planning, design requirements, and things even like the responsibility of the designers themselves. And each of these approaches obviously provides some sort of insight into how meaningful human control of these systems can even be understood and hopefully attained. Although they are generally proposed as like isolated frameworks where each author of these, these approaches speaks of, uh, speaks of these uh, approaches in a siloed way, uh, they do share some underlying precepts. So approaches that emphasize operational planning and military context of use, I think provide a strong con contextual landscape for understanding meaningful human control. Whereas other approaches may focus on things like design histories, the intentions of designers and what their plans are and the responsibility of designers and maybe like the design corporations, those who are responsible for designing them as supra individual agents who potentially can be held responsible um, for their own creations. And I think they provide like cogent arguments for designing these systems with both uh, backward and forward looking responsibility. But still, I think they largely focus on a single level of, of abstraction, which comes often at the opportunity cost of another. So what I wanted to discuss in this presentation, which I'll, I'll try to keep short, but I, I don't think I will, um, is that meaningful human control can only be attained if militaries and industries work closer together as a supra individual agent. So as a way of marrying these often isolated projects of defining, of defining meaning for human control. So I want us to remember that's what we're focusing on this concept of meaning for human control. I propose what would be a two tiered approach to understanding the concept. So first, I think it doesn't make sense to divorce discussions of autonomous weapon systems from the actual and often trivial and sometimes boring military operations. Uh, these systems, these autonomous weapon systems exist within this landscape, not outside of it. That means we have to situate these systems within their operational context of use in order to actually understand them. But this doesn't mean that there are no accountability gaps in terms of technical fully autonomous weapon systems. And that means it's a question of design, which remains important for determining how responsive a system is to the relevant moral reasons of the relevant agents. And I think this is what we would call the design level. So we have these two levels, the operational level and the design level. And by coupling these two levels, I think we can account for technical and full autonomy of certain types of autonomous weapon systems. And I think that by doing so, many of the issues associated with fully autonomous weapon systems can be rendered non-issues. So I think it merits starting with the higher level, like I mentioned of the two, the operational level of control. And this level of meaningful human control, I think we can begin by grounding it on military operation practices that both support and constrain targets in areas of operation. So this level of control focuses on higher level organization and operational control of the military as a super individual agent. This addresses, I think, the fact that the autonomy of an autonomous weapon system and of any agent in the military, like a soldier or an airman, is necessarily constrained by these operations. The result of these constraints is that full autonomy in brackets, you know, quotations, which is often construed in discussions of autonomous weapon systems is not full in the sense that that's implied in the sense that we intuit, which would be self-determining agents. That's not actually the case. Instead, it's restricted to various operational decisions and planning a priori to de deployment of those operations. So it's these 
the plans that, that usually happen before a military operation is carried out that constrain what we would call full autonomy. And that goes not just for systems, but for people as well. So I think we can actually use uh, a case of conventional area operations to frame human involvement um, in these operations uh, in a dynamic targeting process. And I think this would be illustrative. So by framing the role of a human agent decision-making within a distributed system, I think we can outline ways policymakers and theorists can determine how military planning and operations actually function. Autonomous weapon systems, I think, then can be deployed within the context of use of these practices, uh, which I think character characterizing the, the human role in the military decision making, not the autonomous weapon system outside of the, the, the human dynamic system. So if we start off with the pre-mission, so this is generally how uh, before a mission is actually undertaken. So if we use air operations as our example, so let's say an airstrike, right? The air component receives a briefing with information on the mission's execution. And these briefings are often like really highly detailed with information, things like target location, obviously, uh, times, the types of munitions that are gonna be used. Uh, but they're also less detailed when it comes to dynamic targeting in situ. So things that can happen on the fly, things that happen impromptu. And this information is distributed to the various domains of operation to specialists. And these specialists then vet the information and they use it to create more detailed planning. The executors of the mission, in this case would be fighter pilots, are brought in for briefing on the mission's details. And the pilots take the time to study the information uh, that's provided to them while also taking care of any last minute preparations for execution. Uh, to find the target for operations, intelligence and data are obviously required. And this, uh, and this target and data are pre-programmed in the navigation system of both the fighter jet and uh, the, the munitions, the payload. So whereas a dynamic target requires in situ data, so things that happen on the fly, uh, the task here involves arriving at the pre-programmed weapons envelope, which is the area where the weapon is actually capable of effectively reaching its target. And this process is displayed on the operator's heads-up display when they arrive within the weapons envelope. So once the pilot arrives in this area, the onboard system aims to positively identify the target, which was already confirmed during operational planning. And this ensures that the payload delivery complies with the relevant military and legal norms in the case. Uh, the targets were pre-planned and confirmed. So for target, uh, positive target identification, the operator usually doesn't engage in visual confirmation. They're often too high up. Uh, instead, they, re they refer, they defer to the onboard systems and the validation that took place during the operational planning to ensure lawful engagement of the target that's been identified. So even in this fixed case of pre-planning, the human pilot doesn't need to attend to anything else really during the phase, during this phase, other than arriving within the weapons envelope. The operator tracks the target within this weapons envelope to ensure the continuity of identification that's positive, it remains positive. Uh, this also provides like concurrent updates regarding the position and status of the target. Uh, and in the case of a, status, uh, a, a static target, like a military compound, tracking is relatively straightforward, involves simply entering the weapons envelope um, in this fixed phase. And it's during this phase that the relevant rules of engagement and laws of armed conflict and other targeting rules are invoked to ensure that the targeting is lawful and the deployment is lawful. And these also address other considerations like uh, issues related to collateral damage and risk factors that may result to one's own forces also. So in this predetermined and validated target case, the legal and military experts who vetted the target permit the pilot to simply input the relevant data into their vehicle and weapons payload delivery systems to ensure that the execution is proper, that it's legally justifiable. So given the visually if we imagine that in this scenario, which can easily happen, that there's a visual impairment, like weather conditions that change constantly, even with um, forecasts, any further collateral damage estimates after the payload is delivered can even really be attained by the pilot themselves, who has, 
there's an epistemic gap between where the pilot physically is and where the target could be or where it is, even when the, the system positively confirms its identification. But planning at the pre-mission stages validated the collateral damage estimates. And they could say they were low enough that allow for lawful conduction of the, of the, of the mission. And that's according to the norms that govern them. So the pilot doesn't have to actively participate or intervene beyond piloting their vehicle simply within the weapons envelope. So once the operator enters this designated weapons envelope, the computer suggests to the pilot the most opportune time for releasing the payload to ensure that it's actually effective. And this, suggested, this suggestion is based on like knowledge of the capabilities of the equipped weapon system, right? So we know what it's capable of before we choose it, right? Weaponeering. And given the payload system itself is GPS guided, there's no need for any other forms of targeting based on visual identification. Once the pilot authorizes the release of the weapon, the munitions guide themselves to the target. So at this point, the results from the previous stage are assessed to determine the effects of the strike. Of course, a visual assessment from the pilot can be impaired by a, numer a number of factors, like weather conditions in this case, right? Similarly, visual assessments of collateral damage from the vantage point of a pilot may also fail, even if they're capable of seeing it to accurately reflect the efficacy of the strike and its eventual consequences. So in the case of aerial engagements like this, ground support forces are often required for a more accurate assessment of that engagement. So what does this mean for meaningful human control then? Well, it appears that most if not all of the performance laid into each step is beyond the pilot's control, it could be argued that this is actually emblematic of contemporary aerial operations more broadly. So while the pilot can be seen to be in direct operational control of some of the operation, like piloting the craft to the weapons envelope and engaging in weapons release, this type of control is not sufficiently meaningful in the sense that we want when we're talking about autonomous weapon systems. And this is because the pilot lacks the full cognitive clarity and awareness of the situation in which they're actively participating. And this lack begs the underlying question of whether the pilot actually possesses levels of clarity and awareness sufficient enough to be deemed substantial in a meaningful way. And discussions at the pilot level, when we look just at that, that loci there, could provide some insight, both for operations employing autonomous weapon systems, as well as even just regular modern aircraft. But this would converge on the operator, which I think is the wrong vector to look for meaningful human control. Alternatively, I think that discussions should emphasize how the military more broadly, as an organization, as a super individual agent, can have meaningful human control over targeting operations. And because of this, the ongoing international debate, I think, on autonomous weapon systems focuses overly much on the de de deployment stage of autonomous weapon systems and their relations to individual operators. And in so doing, the debate attempts to locate the vector for meaningful human control between those two agents, the system and the human. But it ignores, I think, the broader covariance of the distribution of labor between agents within a military complex that determines decision-making practices right from the beginning. So the steps we outlined here that you see here on the screen, particularly the pre-mission briefing stage with its collateral damage and proportionality assessments are largely sidelined in these discussions. And I think this approach shows the need for a distributed notion of meaningful human control to accurately account for the numerous decisions and measures undertaken by the different agents in the broader decision-making mechanism before deployment even takes place. Different agents have different levels of control over any given vector in the process. So that means that any sufficient conception of meaningful human control must reflect this dynamic. And of course, this doesn't negate the role that the human operators play, obviously, but it positions the role within the larger distributed network of decision-making. So here, full autonomy is not full in the sense that it's commonly intuited. It's constrained by the larger apparatus within which it forms a part. So that's what I would call the higher operational level of control. But like I mentioned, there's a second level of control, one that's a little bit lower. 
And that's a design level of control. And in this level, meaningful human control, I would argue, is the covariance between how a system behaves and the intentions or reasons behind an agent's decisions and actions. Okay, so that sounds complex. So what does it actually mean? It means that systems can be designed in ways that permit agents to forfeit some of their direct operational control while still possessing global control over the system itself. This means actually, counterintuitively, that more rather than less levels of autonomy may, in certain cases, permit more meaningful control over a system. So as mentioned just before, more direct operational control like the pilot has little meaning in the desired sense, I think, for autonomous weapon systems. So with this understanding, I think clear lines of accountability can be drawn when humans remain in the loop over a system as tracking the relevant reasons behind an agent's decisions is, ne is a necessary condition for meaningful human control. The retention of humans in the loop, I think allows for meaningful human control to take place. And I think that this approach to understanding meaningful human control is comprehensive in its breadth, which looks beyond individual systems rather to the whole social technical infrastructure in which these systems form a part in which they're embedded. So although the specific design and the deployment of a system implicates important factors in understanding meaningful human control, they can't be understood in isolation from the infrastructures, the organizations, and the other agents who are inextricably connected to their design, deployment, and use, which I would call the military industrial complex, effectively. So this approach focuses on the design level because it describes meaningful human control as something that could be designed for by engineers. It's not something that happens after the fact. So in other words, meaningful human control are technical design requirements, not only for the system itself, but also for the whole social technical infrastructures that are relevant to its design and use. So I think that in order to design for meaningful human control, two necessary conditions must be met, tracking and tracing. Satisfying these two conditions permits a more comprehensive conception of meaningful human control that reaches beyond that of solely end users. That's what we're trying to get beyond here. It's not just the end user who's responsible, right? They're part of a larger social technical infrastructure. Here, a level of meaningful human control is extended to agents such as designers and policymakers along with organizations and even states. So with this control comes clear lines of attributing responsibility. But for the sake of time, I won't go into the depths of the design level because, I, because this fundamentally is a function of engineers and designers. But if you want to know more about that, I'll, you feel free to contact me or obviously you can buy the book uh, after the fact. I'm sure a link will be shared which goes into actually how, what, what it actually means to have design requirements and what those design requirements can actually look like. Functionally, I think that meaningful human control is a form of design thinking and design engineering for that concept. So as I mentioned in the introduction, the central premise of a possible ban on autonomous weapon system is often grounded in a certain level of autonomy that results in an accountability gap in the event that something goes wrong. But we have to be very clear what we mean when we speak about autonomy for autonomous weapon systems. In the literature and in discussions, we often hear these five levels of autonomy. The least problematic stage is level one. And levels four and five are arguably the more problematic ones, I think even intuitively. And both are seen as dangerous due to how an autonomous weapon system selects a target. So we have opacity in the system, you know, something that's usually talked about when we talk about artificial intelligence. And then there's also, also the limits of things like computer vision and our sensors. And it's technical ability to do this as a function of various targeting norms and rules of engagement. So there may be a disconnect between how the system actually works, right? And then the rules we want it to follow by. I think level four questions the cognitive clarity of a human operator who actually has the veto power when determining the validity of the targets chosen by the system. But regardless, I think level five is typically the subject of, uh, of debate. And I think it's considered the descriptor of what we actually mean when we use the word full autonomy in terms of autonomous weapon systems. And here, I think we can already begin to tease out some of the issues of problematizing autonomy as an issue per se. 
So I think there are other convincing arguments against autonomous weapon systems other than the supposed accountability gap uh, proposed by you know, autonomous weapon systems, like the dehumanization of war and maybe its deleterious effects on human dignity, although that's an iffy one also. But it appears that actual military operations planning and deployment intuitively constrains the autonomy of any given agent, soldier, or autonomous weapon systems as being a function of a larger a priori plan. And I think this bears little, if any, intrinsic operational value outside their functional capacity to actually carry out those plans. Obviously, this doesn't extricate autonomous weapon systems deployed within um, these, these contexts from possibilities of limitless action, like you know, just killing whoever, obviously not. As a predicate for technical design requirements, I think that design has to reflect the proximal and distal intentions and goals of the relevant agents within the deployment envelope. So these would be like the commanders who employ these weapons in their areas of operations, as well as the potential human operators who may be engaging with them symbiotically on the ground, right? Uh, aerial autonomous weapon systems like fully autonomous drones with ground-based operators. So regardless, the, system, the system's capacity to respond to those moral reasons of those agents that are working alongside them has to be considered as a foundational variable in the weaponeering decision-making process for any given context of development in the pre-mission stages. So its ability to be able to be in sync with our values has to be one of the main, if not the foundational variable for even choosing an autonomous weapon system as the weapon of choice for that given mission. So the procedural process of operational planning and target identification form what I would say like the higher or the meta level of meaningful human control as clear lines of causality can be conceptualized by doing that. And I think this culminates in weapons release and efficacy assessments. And similarly, the design level, the lower one, of meaningful human control is functionally dependent on a system's understanding of tracing the design histories, as well as tracking the system's responsiveness to the moral reasons of the relevant agents within the design and use chains of the system. So that goes with the designers and the users in the end also, and the commanders in the middle. So... Within this operational level, the bounds in which weaponeering decisions are made prior to development are contingent on the functionality of the system itself in order for it to even be chosen as the most salient means for carrying out that intended mission. But how the technical responsiveness to the on-the-ground needs for successful mission completion is not contingent on those types of pre-mission assessments. System level recalcitrance, so it not doing what we want on the systems level, can jeopardize the overall level of meaningful human control, even if the system is bound by the operational level control. That's why I argue we need the two levels, the higher meta level of operations, of context, and then the actual design of the system itself. So this means that weaponeering decisions have to be reflected at the design level in order for those decisions to be sufficiently salient prior to the deployment. So in this sense, the operational level feeds down into the design level by supplying the norms, the objectives, the intentions that are necessary for that deployment to even be lawful. These are necessary for the operations level to be holistic in terms of the sufficiency of control. And likewise, the various agents that are essential to these pre-mission planning operations form a part of the population of relevant moral agents, or maybe collectively as a super individual agent. And these agents permit the design level to actually design autonomous weapon systems so that they're sufficiently responsive to their reasons, their intentions, because they're the ones who make the weaponeering of autonomous weapon systems permissible and thus under a priori meaningful human control on both levels. Of course, what does this mean? This means that there needs to be a closer rather than uh, a detached military industrial partnership that uses these agents as stakeholders for whom systems can be designed for. So you're coupling the relevant agents who make the who who uh, adjudicate the rules of engagement and laws of armed conflict when making decisions of what systems to use and in what context. 
So one scenario that's often discussed in the literature against autonomous weapon systems is that of an autonomous weapon system killing civilians. So within this scenario, we can already begin to trace reasons for dismissing it, I think. So in order for an autonomous weapon system to kill a civilian on the ground, the civilian must fall within the weapons envelope delimited prior to even deployment. So the killing is not mala in se to the extent that the collateral damage assessments are agreed upon pre-deployment under existing norms of proportionality. So to some degree, the killing of civilians is not necessarily equivocal to recalcitrance as it can be traced back to the briefing information. So if we imagine that autonomous weapon system kills civilians disproportionately, even within the weapons envelope and even against the explicitly acceptable damages determined in the pre-planning stages, well, this can be construed as technical recalcitrance. This is because it can be traced back to the relevant agents within the design and use histories of the autonomous weapon systems to determine whether the system was designed in such a way as to be maximally responsible to the intentions of those agents. If we can show this not to be the case, then the autonomous system was under meaningful human control. It's thus not a viable option for weaponeering decisions. And its deployment was unlawful overall. And I think this is a good vector for thinking about a ban criteria. If relevant agents like designers and users, commanders, autonomous weapon systems designers, programmers, proportionality experts, the legal experts, are capable of understanding the capabilities and consequences of choosing that system, then they may be said to be in possession of meaningful human control. They have meaningful human control both in their weaponeering decisions at the operational level, as well as in the design decisions at the design level, because they should be stakeholders who are elicited when the system is being designed for, because they're gonna be the ones who are using it. And divorcing one of these levels from the other leaves open vectors from which accountability gaps can arise. So I think that many of the technical issues presented as Mala and say against the development of autonomous weapon systems, such as increased autonomy or targeting civilians are only problematic if decoupled from responsible design, actual military planning and actual operations practices. I think that when we take these into account, augmenting autonomy is necessarily constrained by many if not all of these processes. And in certain cases, autonomy can increase rather than decrease the ability to have meaningful human control. If there are designs so as to be maximally sensitive to the relevant moral reasons of the relevant agents, then they likewise augment meaningful human control rather than lessen it. So divorcing the operational level from the design level leaves design impotent and I think potentially recalcitrant. But divorcing the design level from the operations level uh, leaves operations with an opaque and nebulous lethal tool that may result in poor, if not even unlawful, weaponeering decisions right from the get-go. We can think about systems, and more specifically, these various levels of abstraction as, I think, co-constituting one another. And this permits their inherent complexity to be modeled, I think, more easily. And as a consequence, we can design for complexity rather than leaving design decisions as ad hoc afterthoughts. So I think, uh, I think I'm still within time, so uh, I'll leave it at that. I think I've spoken enough, I'm, I'm tired. Do you wanna unshare your screen? <clears throat> yep. And we have uh, two questions from Bill Casebeer. First, he appreciates the... Um, application of military sociology that you've done. And as a sociologist, I also appreciate this, you know, concrete discussion of who are these people and how do these systems work in, in situ. He suggests that you might want to look at the Air Operations Center as a locus of relevant control. He says it's where the targeting decisions are made and where all kinds of autonomous and semi-autonomous algorithms are at work to assist teams of planners in putting together target portfolios. But then he asks, um, the AI uh, machine learning agent design takes place across a wide variety of groups, government funders, nonprofits, defense contractors, consultants, academic scientists. Where should we start with a code of ethics and which of these groups should we be tackling first to try to ethicize what they're doing? 
That's a hard question. I don't know if I have a, a clear answer to that one of the, the where to start. There, there is a, a large body of literature on how to attribute group responsibility. So I think we have some of the, the philosophical literature on that. Now, whether that's effective or not, I'm unsure. Um, with regards to some of the, the, the AI stuff, that's, of course, very difficult. We're already seeing issues with that in like conversational AI, the conversational AI landscape, which in the military is also a technology that's used. Almost no single agency creates something from ground up, right? Uh, you're using already existing platforms and uh, cloud services to run simulations. And then uh, each facet of that system is created by someone else. So this is the problem of many hands. Um, pretending like it doesn't exist doesn't mean we could just go and attribute responsibility to one of them. I think that that's where some of the issues at the international discussions have emerged from. It's, well, we'll just go to the military and they're the ones responsible. Well, if it's being designed and they don't understand exactly how it works, you can say maybe it's unlawful right from the get-go to even propose it as an option, right? Uh, and I think to a, a large extent, the designers in many cases, when they employ certain types of uh, machine learning, don't also know why it does what it does in many cases. I think that we can resolve some of the machine learning stuff to a certain degree. Uh, I'm working on how quantum computing, the statistical probabilities of quantum computing can actually increase fairness and, and, uh, and trust in a system that classical computing, artificial intelligence cannot, simply cannot do. Um, but I think that what my proposal does is it's, it's comprehensiveness and breadth excludes certain types of systems from being used even in the first place. So it becomes even more stringent. Yes, certain systems can, we can augment autonomy and have more meaningful human control as a consequence. But I think it, certain types of machine learning are a priori excluded right from the get-go. So anybody that would even propose using certain types of machine learning, even despite their efficiency, right, or their ability to process large quantities of data would be excluded right from the get-go. Because if at least one person within the design and use chain if there's not at least one person that understands the entire capabilities of the system, uh, then you cannot have meaningful human control over it. And it's already unlawful right from the get-go. So I think it creates a high standard. But if that high standard could be met, you can actually increase autonomy. Nir, Alec? You're, you're muted, Nir. Sorry. Um... Great talk, Steve. Uh, so to reformulate your last point, uh, it seemed to be that uh, if there's an AI agent um, that uh, is not completely understood by anyone uh, in the uh, network of uh, design, then there can't be an actual uh, uh, design process that's related to it. And that's why it's outlawed. Something along those lines. Uh, I, I would say that it's unlawful right from the get-go because if one person is not capable of at least understanding the system, then you can't attribute responsibility anywhere. So you can't even make a like cogent weaponeering decision uh, of when you would want to deploy that because you're not even 100% sure of what the system is capable of doing or what it's not capable of doing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you have, they have to take as, the, the, as many steps necessary to maximize a system's responsiveness to the intentions of at least one person within the design and use chain. Now, it's obvious it's usually not going to be one person. It's usually going to be a team of people. But so, if no one knows the full capabilities of a system, or if no one is even capable of, um, of trying to figure that out, so for example, the opacity of certain AI systems, simply resist that kind of... Uh, understanding, right? Even if a system is fully transparent, that's why I don't equate transparency with uh, with explicability. They're not the same thing. So, when it so comes to AI. okay. So, the, so then the normative sort of fulcrum, the normative center of the argument is uh, has to do with the capacity to design, with the ability to competently design. Got it. Um, just by analogy, um, in other areas of public policy, uh, even high areas, of, uh, even uh, high impact areas of public policy, like vaccine policy, um, the fact that we don't know how vaccines uh, work um, 
And as a result, based on this argument, can't completely have a design um, or don't know uh, exactly how certain kinds of medications work uh, that are not vaccines. And as a result, can't have a um, design process that's related to them doesn't necessarily uh, constitute a uh, knockdown uh, moral argument. Now, I'm assuming there's relevant uh, differences between the two, uh, maybe because one is supposed to do good and the other is supposed to uh, do harm. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on, uh, on the analogy why the inability to design in some context is not a knockdown argument and the inability uh, to design in this one is? Well, I think you, you you already kind of like answered the question yourself. That was going to be my answer. One has the intention of, uh, in theory, saving lives. And the other one is, well, the exact opposite. Yeah. Well, I mean, except for a, a broader Klosevichian view of military affairs where they could also be said to be saving lives. Uh, fair enough. Touche. Yeah. That, that actually relates to a question I have, Steve, about... Um, just war theory, it seems like until the Ukraine war, I think, um, it was very difficult for a lot of the uh, debate around uh, autonomous military robotics to posit an ethical use because most people are like, can't we just not have wars anymore and not have, not have killing anymore? Um, but now, if you, if you saw the video of these submarine drones that Ukraine sent against these Russian ships in the, in the harbor there, um, the intrepid, you know, intrepidly dodging bullets as they're going to blow up a ship, it's hard not to cheer for, uh, you know, the, the good side, a good side, a side that you can relate to. And in that context, I, I think it raises this question. You, you're trying to push the ethical questions up into the socio-technical um, organization of this process to a certain but the, degree but but at the highest level it's like is this a just conflict in the first place well my my, my issue is not to create like um I, I guess you could say a comprehensive standard it's critique it's more of a critique of one of the main reasons why that like for those who, who don't know the campaign to ban killer robots for example uh, although there are numerous arguments for the potential ban prohibition of autonomous weapon systems, one of the strongest arguments have been uh, the loci of autonomy, so level five autonomy. I would argue that perhaps that's not the best um, the the best grounding for a ban. I'm trying to uh, I try to show the counterintuitive notion that in certain cases, so the whole point is context. Because I can even give examples in which even a good autonomous weapon system. Um, let me let me give let me give one example of why context is is extremely important when it comes to autonomous weapon systems. And this this has something related to 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 just war, but it's 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 a legal doctrine called ors de combat, which is essentially when you're when you're uh, in the power of of the adversary. So so. Part of the legal understanding, I think, of what it means to be out of combat. So there's this concept of being out of combat, or is the combat um, is being in the power of an adverse party. So I'm sure Nier is familiar uh, with this concept. And okay, so what does exactly that mean when we're talking about autonomous weapon systems? Being in the power of an adverse uh, of an adversary, right? Of an adverse party. Can someone be in the power of an autonomous weapon systems? And I think there'll be likely many implications of this, but uh, we could contend that in the light of uh, widely varied and potential dynamic situation in which autonomous weapon systems will eventually be deployed, is that these they must be capable of responding to changing and continually uh, dynamic contextualized evaluations of what of an enemy status. Are they in combat or are they out of combat? Right. In order to remain lawful, a system must be able to, on the fly, deter make these determinations. Are they in combat or are they not? So I think autonomous weapon systems should be treated individually, given that the context of their use, aerial, that was the example I've already given, naval, ground base, are substantively different. So this is one of the reasons why, well, general ban, I go, well, that doesn't really make much sense because the context is what matters here. So I think that even within these broader categories, aerial, naval, ground-based, 
different types of autonomous systems will come with their own capabilities and obviously their own limitations. Some that will, I think, potentially change simply by their nature when an enemy is deemed out of combat. So for example, this is an example that me and a colleague of mine, uh, Nathan Wood, came up with in a, in a paper we published uh, last year. Uh, so we can imagine a lightly armored autonomous drone may often encounter enemies who are neither defenseless nor powerless, while a heavily armored autonomous assault platform will likely encounter individuals fitting both of those descriptions. So I think that this in turn requires that such a system possesses a level of technical sophistication high enough that allows for calculations which are sensitive to many contextual factors that'll impact upon the relative strength and power of all the belligerent groups. Although I don't think this is technically impossible, the viability as well as the necessity of this is I think beyond the technical plausibility at present. But I think that, that what this betrays is that the out of combat status is fundamentally tailored to the entities that are making the evaluations, given their capacity, their capabilities and their limitations. So a foot soldier makes a very different evaluation than a tank commander who makes a very different evaluation than an autonomous sentry turret, which I think would all make a very different evaluation than a Reaper drone would make. So I think that we came up with these two cases that are very similar, but changes, I think, everything when, when you look at how context really matters. And this is where the ban critic, uh, the, the people who are supporting a ban, I think, really need to look at. So if we imagine a fully autonomous Reaper drone, right, it's designated, it's given the order, right, it's programmed, it has to neutralize an insurgent leader. So we can call this case the high value target case. It has to take out a high value target. So the commander of the forward operating base, along with his tacticians and his legal professionals and the other experts that are around them, they determine that the most efficient plan is to neutralize the target via an aerial strike. And they determine that the strike is lawful. So they meet all their assessments. The commander has a fully autonomous Reaper drone outfitted to undertake the mission. So they make the weaponeering decision. They know the type of munitions that have to be loaded on board. And the drone is tasked with taking off. It arrives at the target's location. It confirms that the target is present. It confirms that the target is not in the vicinity of so many non-combatants, which would therefore render the strike disproportionate. It releases its payload, and then it's supposed to fly back to base. But suppose that while en route to the target, the drone passes over a company of heavily armed enemy combatants, and they're isolated in the hilltops, right? So despite the fact that the group is very heavily armed, their offensive and de defensive ca uh, capacity against the drone is functionally irrelevant. They can't do anything against the drone, even if they're really heavily armored. And in this case, the hostile party is rendered out of combat, simply even if they're heavily armored. Okay, so you go, okay, well, that seems weird, but I, I can kind of get it, right? They can't do anything against the drone. So even if they're fully armored and, uh, and fully armed, they can't do anything. So we can change this up a little bit, this, this case study. So imagine that the, the same base commander, instead of sending the Reaper drone alone, decides to deploy a team of Navy SEALs to neutralize the target and that they're to travel using ground vehicles. So in this case, the high value target, but with SEALs, an autonomous Reaper drone is deployed to provide close air support to that ground base unit. All the factors remain the same in the high value target with the SEAL team encountering the same heavily armed company of enemy troops. In this case, the Reaper should arguably not view the enemy combatants as being out of combat because those enemies can now inflict casualties on the SEALs and thus are not powerless and therefore are legitimate targets for the Reaper drone. So in this case, the Reaper drone plus the SEAL form an even greater asymmetric advantage over the enemy combatants. However, the factors that determine out of combat status are not simply whether or not one is able to defend oneself, but rather whether or not one has the power to affect one's enemy. So in this case, despite the advantage held by the SEALs and the Reaper together, the enemy troops are nonetheless able to inflict casualties, whereas in the first case, they're powerless against the Reaper drone. And therefore, they're arguably to be deemed out of combat. So if we take 
this together, these points, I think, demonstrate that certain classes of people are not to be treated as out of combat a priori, right? But rather what it's meant to demonstrate is that contextual factors can change the status of the same group of people, all other things remaining equal, simply by changing the other actors, machine or human involved in the scenario. So for autonomous weapon systems, this means that it would be nonsensical, if not technically unfeasible, to create a blanket method for such systems to determine whether or not enemies should be classified as out of combat. And I think that it would be the case even for specific types of autonomous weapon systems, because any given combat scenario is marked by a dynamism, changing, right? Changing context. And this has to be re reflected in the ways autonomous systems operate in order to accurately determine whether or not enemies are in fact out of, com uh, out of combat. And I think right now there are technical obs obstacles for this, for this actually taking place, whether a system is actually capable of making these kind of fine grained distinctions in order to remain lawful. So the point of me display uh, of illustrating this case is that what I, uh, in my book, what uh, my discussion today was to show that perhaps targeting autonomy as the vector for a ban may not be the proper vector for actually a ban. And instead, maybe something like this in and of itself is enough to say, well, no, the system is unlawful because currently, right, feasibly, we do not have the technical capacity for a system to make such fine grained decisions on the fly, which is necessary. Right now, humans are, of course, won't to err. They can make errors in, in these types of distinctions also. But in principle, they can, right? Whereas the system seems as of now technically in principle incapable of making decisions. So maybe the people who are going for a ban, they either, either respond to the, the critique I made of autonomy that it could actually increase meaningful human control, right? Maybe certain classes of autonomous weapon systems cannot be under meaningful human control a priori, maybe ground-based ones. My example that I gave was aerial autonomous weapon systems because there's a certain epistemic gap. I would argue like my colleague, Nathan Wood perhaps, if a system becomes very good at seeing the ground, right, that MS epistemic gap no longer exists, and it's able to make even greater distinctions and may be de facto illegal by doing so. Um, Dan Feldman asks <clears throat> a question that I think relates to the, the kind of move that you're making of pushing of deconstructing the concept of autonomy by um, doing this detailed analysis of the socio-technical system around it. And he basically asks, um, and I think you still implied in your talk that it's important to have uh, actors who understand the ethical trajectory of what's happening. Um, and Dan asks, uh, given the increasingly complex nature of these decisions and the ways that they're embedded in these complex organizations, is it really still possible to have personal responsibility be compelling as an ethical argument or um, should instead this be seen as, a, as simply a system design question and get away from the questions of individual responsibility? Perhaps there are, may, like right now I have nothing on the top of my head, but I'm sure someone could propose a situation which, for example, a bad weaponeering decision was made with the full cognitive clarity of how a system actually works, in which case you can say that the single person is, is responsible. But um, like I mentioned, the, the briefing stages, no single person makes like all these decisions, right? At a, at a fine grain level. It really is uh, a the problem of many hands here. So I think when we're talking about autonomous weapon systems, and we're seeing this also shift in the discussions of autonomous vehicles, that when we're talking about responsibility, we should be talking about group responsibility uh, and this closer interaction between policymakers users and designers that there's in the age of artificial intelligence where there's emergent sometimes unforeseen or even unforeseeable behavior um, designers can no longer create a system and then sell that system and wash their hands of it that's not how things work anymore right or that's not how things should work uh, anymore because uh, it's no longer a product that remains somewhat static but changes as new information comes uh, is inputted Right, so that there has to be, like I would argue in, in the book, I also argue when I talk about value sensitive design as the potential approach to design the system itself. So I'm talking about the technical system, but also 
uh, reflected within policy simultaneously, right? Because we know that often policy lags behind. So co-creating co policy and the technology simultaneously, right? Um, permits what we would call, I think a necessary condition would be full life cycle monitoring. So when it comes to these types of potentially dangerous systems, um, it's no longer the product demand and supply view of, you know, creating a product and selling it but the, the designers are responsible for the product across its entire life cycle, monitoring it across its entire life cycle, and then pulling it out of the deployment stage, right? When unwanted emergent behavior manifests itself. These questions are of course applicable to so many domains, just autonomous cars, for instance. Um, I do, and I wanted to mention that one of the things that blew my mind when I first um, made this connection in regards to this topic is that the autonomy of landmines. I think it's one, one of the moves that we typically make at the IET is to say, well, you think this is an emerging technology problem. This is actually an old technology problem. And with landmines, you have somebody who decides where to put them, knowing that their autonomy is restricted to somebody stepping on them or running into them. It's a different ocean. kind of autonomy. And that's why my right. whole argument is nuanced. So that one, like so, some scholars have just called that not exactly autonomy, but independence, right? Because there's, there's no, um, it, it's indiscriminate, right? Uh, it doesn't, it can't distinguish between good or bad, right? Friend or foe, whoever mm -hmm. steps on it, steps on it, doesn't matter. It's indiscriminate, right? It's simply independent. It's not autonomous in the uh, in the sense that we want. There's, there's different levels of that. You have automatic, autonomic, uh, uh, semi-autonomous, fully autonomous. So it's a, it's a gradation. And yeah, all the way up to all the discussion about um, targeting systems on the different missiles in the Ukrainian battlefield that, you know, some get you there within an inch and some get you there within a mile. But um, Bill Casebear says, uh, we don't presently hold human soldiers to this high standard of determining who is in and out of combat status. Um, rather, in extraordinary circumstances, we take the wearing of a military uniform during wartime as being on its face, the epistemic evidence of combatancy. Um, couldn't our autonomous systems use this same standard? It's, it's not as, it would be far less rigorous than what you're proposing, but. Um, so if this, so by that standard, even if they drop their arms and they're still in uniform and put their hands up, the system would then kill them because the only, the only necessary condition for firing is that they're wearing of the uniform. So that seems, mm, perhaps dubious, I would think, and perhaps unlawful, if the only condition was simply wearing of the uniform. Mm -hmm. Just like even within orders to combat, um, if the enemy is sleeping, for example, or they simply cannot attack back, and there, there are certain cases in which you simply cannot go in and just, you know, assassinate everyone, right? Um, in or out of uniform. So I, I think that just the locus of just being in uniform is, is not a sufficient condition. Perhaps you could say it's a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. Near. No, I think, um, uh, Steve, going uh, based on your uh, sociological approach uh, from the history of war, the more uh, frequent uh, case is when uh, clear principles are knowingly violated, which is the sort of dark underbelly uh, of uh, human autonomy. So, um, Quite often, what happens is that, uh, you know, quite often the explanation, for example, for war crimes is people very clearly aware of the rules of war and violating them because they're overcome by uh, anger, overcome by rage, overcome by uh, uh, the memory of their dead friends, uh, or what have you. Um, that's a classical case in which, from a utilitarian point of view, uh, autonomy is uh, more human autonomy is more problematic than uh, potentially machine autonomy. So, as I was thinking about your order combat um, example, one case study uh, came to mind. So, quite often in the transport, for example, of prisoners of war, the soldiers who accompany the transport will um, hurt the prisoners of war. Um, you could think of a uh, autonomous uh, truck transporting uh, uh, prisoners of war in which that possibility uh, would be diminished. So was that was there a question? I was, I, was so, I, I guess the question more broadly is the sort of 
what's the yeah you're right uh that didn't sound like a question but the, <laughs> the, the 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 observation more broadly is to some extent one's attitude towards autonomous systems depends on one's favorite moral and normative system that one is working with in the first place a utilitarian sort of uh, uh, preference or tendency gives you an altogether different answer here there there's good reasons to think just like there's good reasons to think with autonomous uh, vehicles that the number eventually as these systems become better that the number of uninvolved deaths will actually decline once you uh, introduce autonomous weapon system well so one of the things is uh I think that as as the technology as the promises, I, I think autonomous weapon systems to a certain degree will actually eventually undermine themselves, their own legality. Uh, Nathan Wood makes a very strong argument for this: is that many of the promises of the benefits of autonomous weapon systems, you know, not committing war crimes, their ability to be extremely precise, right? So killing ethically, whatever whatever that means, right? Um, if a system is actually capable of being so precise that it can determine whether or not to like the like the, the the precision of of firing at someone right is enough to make the killing ethical then it shouldn't even be making the killing in the first place because it can incapacitate the target just as precisely with non lethal force so if the system becomes so good that it can use non lethal and lethal force in order to achieve the same ends, legally it must use non-lethal force. So the promise of lethal autonomous weapon systems remains a promise so long as that many of the technical capacities that, it's, that, that many scholars promise that it will have don't actually become manifest. Because as soon as the system is, is capable of making such a discrimination with the technical capacity, then it should not make the lethal decision when it is the, the non-lethal decision is open. Of course, non-lethal tools have their own ethical questions. I remember Putin used uh, sleeping gas to um, put down a Chechen uh, hostage situation and killed, I don't know, a lot of Russians in the process. So um, every non-lethal tool would have its own, you know, are they gonna wake up too soon? Are they never gonna wake up? That kind of question. Um, we've got Peter Osaro, he says, uh, He's, he's pointing us to an argument that was made in his writing. So welcome, Peter. Uh, Bill also asks about, do we need to understand every feature of a machine learning agent to be held accountable for its use? No, but there should be, uh, well, we know, we know, but someone should be, cap uh, should be capable of understanding what the system is capable of doing, right? So there should be uh, no unforeseen emergent behavior, right? The system should be, although able to learn and, and change and adapt to its environment, right? That means there's going to be, like I mentioned, certain types of machine learning that should be excluded from the beginning, because some of that excludes that type of cognitive clarity uh, from the beginning. We should know what the system is capable of doing. So anything beyond that is like, well, we don't know if the system could go rogue. Well, I think that that would mean that it's not under meaningful human control. And then if you use it anyway, well, the person who know, who knowingly uses it would it, it would be unlawful from the get go. No, not everyone within the design history, design and use chain of the system should know what every part of the system does. No, that's that's a lot of cognitive overload, right? Uh, someone working symbiotically with the system on the ground, for example, does it, it would be ridiculous to expect them to know exactly how it works. I don't think most pilots know exactly how the the jet they fly works, right? At a technical level, they just know it does work. Right, but there is someone who does know exactly how it works. Right, Alec, did you have anything? Well, I mean, my question was answered in part by the question asked by Dan. The question of personal responsibility, how we think about that in relation to your design uh, perspective, um, and I think you know you've answered that. There, the there's a scholar I. I his name unfortunately escapes me, but I believe it's Taylor, who wrote on uh, group responsibility specifically when it concerns the military and, and states. So the relation between military action and states, which I think is, is an enlightening read. Uh, maybe Isaac, Jake, uh, Isaac Taylor, I believe his, his name is. Uh, it's escaping me, but I believe that's his name. Uh, 
I remember thinking a lot about this topic when I was doing my dissertation and thinking about doctors making mistakes. We had done a project at the University of Chicago Hospital looking at how often doctors and nurses in the hospital made mistakes and how rarely they were reported and the um, consultations, the mortality and morbidity consultations that they did to try to figure out, can we fix this at a systemic level? And it's like, when you when you really look at any system like this, do you hold the person responsible for making a mistake when the system is obviously mistake generating mistakes in various ways, right? For, through its poor design. And so, yes, I think your paper contributes to that kind of a perspective as well. Um, okay, well, I think we have come to the end of this talk. Um, any final thoughts, Steve? No, I, I appreciate it. If anyone is actually interested in reading the book, I don't know why you would be. It's boring. It was boring to write it. I'm sure it's boring to read. <laughs> but if you contact me, I have, uh, they sent me today a 35% discount code. So excellent. Okay. I'm not good at promoting my own material. <laughs> and to get that, uh, can we send an email to you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, Steve's, I don't have it immediately in front of me, but Steve, you can find Steve's email pretty easily. And again, um, everyone who's interested in this topic, please consider writing something for the JEET special issue on military ethics. Alec, what's our next uh, event? Our next event will be on November 30th. Uh, and that is with Lee Phillips, where we will be talking about climate change, degrowth, and work. Lee Phillips is a, a strong advocate for a left of center approach that is pro the use of emerging technologies like nuclear power. Um, for climate remediation. So he's been a spicy uh, critic on this topic, uh, uh, controversial among many different circles. So I look for, I hope you look forward to that talk as much as I do. And thanks again for joining us today.